And food companies quickly learned that the junk food products, that what we're now calling ultra processed, um, encourage people to eat more. The potato chip ad, you can't eat just one, that's the whole point. These are the most profitable products in the supermarket. Uh, so food companies were doing everything they could to make irresistibly delicious products that people couldn't stop eating. People couldn't stop eating them. They took in more calories. Okay. Hello. Welcome to the podcast. Do we need to say it's Switch for Good anymore, Alexandra? I don't know. It's been a lot of episodes. <laughs> people we know always they have a lot coming. of new people, though. It's <laughs> true. Welcome to Switch for Good. Oh, my goodness. You're Dotsy uh, and I'm Alexandra. <laughs> yes. Very formal of you. This is true. That's what they call us anyway. And we have a super duper, super awesome, cool guest today, uh, Marion Nessel, which we can't wait to dive into. And we might talk to Marion a little bit about what I want to share with our audience before we dive into the guest, because many people have probably heard of Bulletproof Coffee. Well, some scientists that we work with at Switch for Good over a series of conversations on bad health claims conversations that we were having with the scientists, they decided to look into um, bulletproof coffee and came back and said, we really want to do a meta-analysis on ba is basically four studies that bulletproof used to try to say or prove that this was healthy and not only healthy, but would, would help you feel better and not feel hungry and feel satiated and incre increase your performance and your clarity and all of these things. So we said, yeah, yeah, go for it. That would be amazing. And we'll do the hard work to try and get it out to the world, right? We'll do, we'll do the PR. So we just released uh, the release on the, the meta-analysis that they did just about a week ago. And it's a, a new review that shoots holes in Bulletproof Coffee's health claim. And it exposes the lack of scientific evidence for Bulletproof's claims that they make and highlights potential health risks, which I think is probably the most important part. So when, see, Bulletproof Coffee really kind of was born in a long time ago, around 2009, and it made numerous health claims. Really, it's just, you know, fresh brewed coffee with a dollop of saturated fat. It's, it's a dollop of butter or MCT oils or coconut oil, whatever you might choose that, that, that you would put in there. And, and that's it. And this new lit review uh, just completely debunks the claims and, and raises some additional concerns. So it was put out by uh, somebody who didn't have anything to do with nutrition, had no background in nutrition, is not a nutritionist, is a tech entrepreneur and a self-described biohacker. <laughs> Uh, a guy known as Dave Asprey, and in uh, he put it out in it's 2009, but it started gaining really traction by 2011, 2012, and uh, the New York Times called it a I think they called it a cult, like the cult of the bulletproof diet. Um, we talked to a couple of different doctors when putting this uh, press release together. And uh, the integrative cardiologist, Dr. Joel Kahn, texted us back because we said, what do you think of this? And he said, no health trend more represents the emperor is wearing no clothes than bulletproof coffee. It's the worst nutrition advice in history. That was pretty, that was pretty profound. Um, so but yeah, you were interested when we sent this out and you're the one that said, hey, you got to share this with our audience. Yeah, because I read it and I mean, I had been skeptical of Bulletproof Coffee, if I may say so, from the get-go, because adding saturated fat, you and I know, and, our, and regular listeners who've um, heard our interviews with doctors know that no one says that saturated fat is good for you. And so here, Bulletproof Coffee is asking you to add it. So the claims for Bulletproof Coffee were that they would make you feel more alert mm -hmm. and um, more satiated. What what did your meta-analysis find? Well, that review found that that was not the case, actually, uh, for many people. And that some of the evidence suggests that uh, there is a possible elevation in serum cholesterol, gastrointestinal intolerance, uh, has been reported by many following cons consumption of this fat bomb in your morning coffee. 
and it's particularly risky from a cardiovascular health perspective. Like you said, people with um, you know, high cholesterol already and other heart issues are often advised to scale back on butter due to its high amounts of saturated fat. Right. So this is this is a, especially important for people who are at a risk for heart disease or currently have high cholesterol and, you know, are wanting to, to keep their arteries squeaky clean. Adding a fat bomb, uh, as Dr. Khan said, might be the worst nutritional advice ever in history. For people who like have been drinking bulletproof coffee and stuff, um, yeah. where can they go to find your uh, Switch for Goods summary of this meta analysis? Yeah, well, they can just go to the Switch for Good um, website, so switchforgood.org, and just go to our newsroom. We have all of our uh, news media picks up, pickups there and all of the press releases that we put out, so they can really read um, the full release and get into the nitty gritty. Um, and we might have more. We uh, uh, David Goldman was the lead scientist on this review, on this lit review, and he said, you know, I'd also really like to see future uh, actual research explore the impact of regular bulletproof coffee consumption on things like hydration status, kidney stones, acid reflux, gallstones, blood pressure, sweep, sleep quality. I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, hyperlipidemia. So we we may we may push to uh, to do some of that research in the future. Have you heard from Dave Asprey? <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, I haven't. <laughs> I don't think any, I don't know that anyone in the team has. I mean, it, it got picked up in some major uh, uh, media outlets, but you know, there's, he's, it's, it's not the first, this is one of the first lit reviews, but he, it's not the first time that somebody says, you have, you've got to be kidding, promoting yeah. a fat bomb in, in your coffee every morning and not just a fat bomb, a saturated fat bomb. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. listen, uh, <laughs> If anybody's out there who does do bulletproof coffee and who has found that it has helped their uh, lipids, try, uh, you know, right? their cholesterol, um, or if it makes them feel better in the morning, we'd like to hear about it and understand what's going right. on with your body because, you know, scientifically, yeah. it's not healthy. Right. And, and, and it has been proven to be better in terms of uh, performance or attention than regular coffee without the MCT oil or the butter or the heavy cream. Right. And I was that's just what I was going to follow up with is say, you know, a lot of the claims are just found in the, the coffee and the caffeine itself. Right. The, the energy and the jump off of the energy and that, um, you know, yes, we know you and I know that fat not necessarily saturated fat, but fat is is helpful for satiety, no doubt. So, but we want to lean towards uh, whole food plant-based fats in their whole form, like walnuts and almonds and avocados and, and get it that way. And I'll tell you, if I'm, you know, getting a little hangry in the middle of the day and I do a handful of almonds, that fat, it, 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 it holds you over. So not saying that, you know, fat, this is very specifically like, the most saturated fat that you can get in that amount of butter that they suggest you put in, right? So it's just a, yeah, it's a saturated fat bomb. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No bueno. Thank you. Thanks so much for yeah. doing that. I really enjoyed reading. It's very, by the way, user friendly, um, everybody. <laughs> They're talking about studies, but it's very, it's very readable for lay people like, like me mm -hmm. and you. So <laughs> thank, you. thank you for doing it. Thank you for doing it. And and it's great that we're having Marion on today because she can talk further into these kind of myths and fads that we all get caught up in. Yes. And so. Yeah, a lot about the politics of, of, of why we do, right? And, and, and how they drag us in. So I know I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm a little verklempt to hope I can pull this off. You've got me <laughs> if I can't, right? If I, if I get starstruck. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, on to the show. Folks, our food system is broken. We have an obesity crisis. We are failing the environment. The singular goal of food companies is to satisfy shareholders and what we are eating is dictated by marketing, not by science. But some crusaders are fighting back to make fundamental changes and our guest today is one of them. Scientist and acclaimed author, Dr. Marion Nessel 
is a Paulette Goddard Professor in the Department of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health at New York University, and founder of the field of food studies. She's literally the authority on food politics. In fact, she wrote the book on it. And for decades, she has been a transformative figure working to improve our food system and dietary choices while exposing corporate greed and injustice inherent in the food industry. Dr. Nessel is the author of a dozen books. She appears in the hit documentary, Super Size Me, and in the new Netflix doc, You Are What You Eat, among many others. In 2023, she was awarded the prestigious Edinburgh Medal for Science and Humanities. I hope I said that right, Mary. But anyway, we're really thrilled and honored to have you on this podcast with us today. You're a pioneer. Welcome to the show. Oh, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. And thanks for the lovely introduction. You're so welcome. I'm putting on my glasses on because I it was getting a little blurry, your intro. <laughs> Gosh, my goodness. So why don't we don't always start at the beginning, but I think we might today with you. There's there's so much to traverse. Your very first teaching job was in the biology department of Brandeis University in 1975, if we have that correct? It was a little earlier than that, but yes. Okay. So how did you move from teaching molecular biology to nutrition? I mean, how did you get interested in nutrition? Was there a moment? Was it a series of moments? Well, actually, I've always been interested in nutrition. I love food. Right. I really <laughs> love to eat. And I, when I was in high school and I didn't know what I was going to do, uh, my mother had a friend who collected cookbooks. And I was kind of interested in that. Oh, how I wish I had her collection now. The um, and, and she said, you know, you should study about food if you like it. But the options for studying were agriculture. And I was a city girl. I didn't get the whole agriculture thing until much later. Or I could do dietetics. And so I went to Berkeley as a dietetics major. I lasted exactly one day. Oh, Uh, and then uh, and then I was out of there because we were required to take the same five credit chemistry lab class that pre-medical students took. And and then there were all these home economics classes. And I thought, if I'm going to be taking science, I'm going to do the science. Um, because I didn't really understand that if things were hard for you, maybe it wasn't the best thing for you to be doing. And if things uh-huh. were really easy for you, maybe you should consider that you're good at them. And that would be something to do. It took me a long time to figure that out. Um, so I was I, I was a science major and then eventually did my doctorate in molecular biology. And the, de- the biology department at Brandeis at that time had a couple of policies that were very unusual. One of them was that you could only teach the same class three times in a row. Um, and oh. then you had to change because they wanted to keep faculty fresh and up on current on the current science. You had to get out of there and do something Mm. else. And then the other policy was you had to teach whatever the department needed, whether you knew anything about it or not. And it was at a time when students were sitting in in the department chair's office demanding human biology classes. You know, cell and molecular biology are very, that's very abstract. You can't see it, taste it, feel it. Uh, And the students wanted something that felt more relevant to them. Mm. And so uh, I was offered, uh, my three semesters were up, and I was offered a choice of human physiology or human nutrition. Um, And I picked nutrition because I was kind of interested in it. I'd been interested in it for a long time. And I was curious to see whether what people were saying about nutrition had any scientific basis behind it. That was kind of my approach. And, you know, so I got, you know, I tell the story, I wrote a memoir that came out about a year ago, Slow Cooked. And I tell the story Mm -hmm. in that memoir about how, um, teaching nutrition was like falling in love and I never looked back uh, Mm -hmm. because it was the most terrific way to teach biology to undergraduates. Cell and molecular biology is hard because it's so abstract. Mm -hmm. Teaching nutrition is a piece of cake because Mm -hmm. everybody eats and everybody's really interested and they can see what food does in the body and they can taste it and feel it and everybody wanted to talk about it. It was really fun. 
to teach. And I taught that semester and then about, I had about 50 students in the class. And then the next semester, 20 students wanted to take it again and do more. So I did that. And then I left Brandeis and took a job teaching nutrition to medical students and never looked back. Which, wow. as we know on this show, having interviewed many, many doctors is sorely needed. So thank you for that. Um, what What is your basic food philosophy um, and how has it changed over the years? Uh, that's, in, that's an interesting question, because when I started out, I started out in a very biochemical approach to nutrition. What what do we need in the body and what does food have that we need in the body? So I was really interested in nutrients. I was interested in every single vitamin. They're all fascinating. I was interested in every single mineral. They all do such interesting things. I cared a lot about protein, fat, and carbohydrates. And then gradually, as I learned more and more about it, I thought, well, this is, you know, I mean, these are fascinating scientifically, but people don't eat nutrients. They eat food. And so I got more interested in food. And then I finally caught on to agriculture that you cannot understand why people eat the food they do unless you understand how the agricultural system works. And now everything is food system. How does the whole system work? Everything about food from uh, how it's grown to how it's transported, to how it's sold, to how it's marketed, to how people buy it, eat it, waste it, and all of the sociology that goes with that. So I went from being a splitter to a lumber. <laughs> you know, yeah. splitters are, you know, the world divides into splitters and lumpers. And in the beginning, I was a splitter. I was interested in every single nutrient. There are 50 of them. I cared a lot about every single one of them. Um, and now what I'm really interested in is what the whole system looks like. Uh, because I think if we're going to encourage people to eat more healthfully, we need system change. And people don't need to know about nutrients, fascinating as they are. They need to know about systems, how systems work. And was there a, a moment where the, the systems and the systemic society that we're in in food with the, you know, the big players making a lot of money and not wanting to make change, did you run into a situation that you said, oh, wait a minute, hold on, you know, and, and or a political situation, right? You're the author of food politics and food for pet poli politics <laughs> for food for pets. I saw that too. I was like, wow, that's so cool. Because yes, it's a whole, that's a whole nother industry, right? But was there something that happened? Mm -hmm. There was. Yeah. yeah, this was in the early 1990s. I went to a meeting at the National Cancer Institute in Washington that was on behavioral causes of cancer. And I was there to give a talk about dietary uh, determinants of cancer risk. Uh, most of the speakers at that conference were talking about cigarette smoking and lung cancer. Okay. Uh -huh. And, you know, I knew that cigarette smoking caused cancer. I really did. But I had never heard the anti-smoking activists, physicians, and scientists talk about it. I'd never gone to a meeting on cigarette smoking and cancer. And then uh, one of the speakers, who was a scientist at the Cancer Institute at the University of California, San Diego, got up and talked about cigarette marketing to children. And I tell you, I knew that cigarette companies marketed to children. Um, I had seen the Joe Camel ads, which were clearly aimed at teenage boys, but I had never paid any attention to it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I just, and you know, it was so much a part of the natural landscape. Every store you went into, every magazine you read, every TV program you watched had cigarette advertising on it. You just, you know, you tuned it out. And in fact, you're supposed to tune it out if it's done right. And I walked out of that meeting absolutely transformed. I thought, I knew that this was happening, but I had never paid any attention to it. We nutritionists should be doing exactly the same thing for Coca-Cola as these physicians and scientists were doing for uh, Philip Morris or whatever cigarette company they were talking about. 
And that was it. I started paying attention. That was the difference. And Mm -hmm. I started, whenever I traveled, I took photographs of food marketing. I looked at marketing to children particularly because, you know, adults are supposed to know how to resist this sort of thing. Um, But the kids stuff seemed unfair. I started writing articles about particular marketing efforts that I was seeing, pouring um, pouring rights contracts in schools, for example, where schools would have contracts with either Coca-Cola or Pepsi for exclusive sales of those products in their schools. And they would the more that was sold, the more money they would get. I started writing about marketing in general, marketing to children in general. Mm-hmm. I started going to meetings on childhood obesity where, I mean, this was another one where, uh, you know, I, at these meetings, every single speaker would talk about how are we going to get moms to feed their kids more healthfully? Mm-hmm. Nobody was saying, how are we get, going to get the food industry to stop marketing junk food to our kids? Nobody was saying that. And so I began to see that sort of thing. And then the articles that I was writing, eventually I figured out that NYU, where I was teaching, liked books and it was, it was time for me to do a book and I could put those articles together in a book. And that was the genesis of Food Politics, which came out in 2002 and then in subsequent editions in 2007 and 2013. Um, you actually wrote a book? It, I've been doing it ever since. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and to, to, to really... Um have changed people's understanding of how, why we eat what we eat. You actually wrote a book called Soda, Taking on Big Soda and Winning. And you mentioned soda several times just now. Um, I recalled the 1980 movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy. Do you remember that movie where a Coke can falls out of the sky into this primitive tribe and they'd never heard of Coke? But, but the, the the distress that it calls the tribe that one it's basically the story of a man going to try and return the coke can to the gods mm. so it, it's really a metaphor of how soda has become a, 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 a scourge on every part of the world it's probably a larger metaphor about how industrialization has become a scourge but let's talk about soda Tell us a little bit about the soda industry, because it tells us a lot about the food industry as a whole. Well, you know, Coke and Pepsi are American icons and they're symbols of of Amer- the American food system and American um, plenty and the, you know, the fabulous variety of foods that we have. And they were never a problem when they came in eight ounce cans. Um, or seven, now they're 7.5. But when they came in those little small cans or those little eight ounce bottles, they were never a problem. They didn't become a problem until the portion sizes started to increase Mm. because um, sodas or sugar sweetened beverages in general are sugars and water and flavors and that's it. Uh, But it's a lot of sugar. I mean, an absolutely astonishing amount of sugar, almost a teaspoon per ounce. Eight, an eight ounce soda has seven teaspoons of sugar, a 12 ounce, uh, you know, it's almost a teaspoon per ounce. Right. So a 12 ounce soda has 10 teaspoons of sugar. It's a mm-hmm. lot of sugar and, and it has no, no other nutritional value. And that was mm-hmm. never a problem until people started eating more calories and portion sizes got bigger. And the, uh, you know, I, if I had one nutritional concept that I could get across to everybody, it would be that larger portions have more calories. I can't even say it with a straight face because it's so obvious, but it's in fact not intuitively obvious. And we know this because we've dealt, we've done experiments on it where we've asked classes Uh, How many calories in an eight ounce soda and how many calories are there in a 64 ounce soda? And the expectation was that whatever people said the eight ounce was, um, we didn't expect them to know what it was, but whatever it was, we expected them to multiply by eight, eight eights or 64, right? Um, But the average multiplier was three. Um, oh no! And so when the, when we did this in a class, I asked the instructor to go back to the class and say, "You got to ask them 
you know, even NYU, NYU freshmen may be, may be mathematically challenged, but they're not that <laughs> challenged. Um, and so she went back and asked the class, and the class said 800 calories in a soda is impossible. Mm. It's not possible to have that many calories, but in fact, it is. Mm. It is. And so, yeah. you know, when people were drinking eight ounce sodas, it didn't make any difference. If they're drinking a 64 ounce soda, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. An absolutely enormous difference. Um, and, you know, and really taking sugars in liquid form is not good for you, especially if you're already taking in a lot of calories and almost everybody eats more than they need to. 70% of American adults are overweight or, or obese. Mm-hmm. You know, the first thing you do if you want to lose weight is to stop drinking sugar sweetened beverages. Yeah, that's a great start. I was curious about that stat because just in order to understand the scope and the breadth of what you're talking about, like you said, in in 2023, last year, 70% of American adults were overweight or obese. Can you give us the stats on what it was like 50 years ago compared to both? Like what's happened? Yeah, 15%. Okay. Uh, adults were or, or obese or maybe certainly no more than 20. It went up very, very slowly during the 20th century until 1980. Uh, when the Real quick, what was the cause? Like what those 15 percent? Do you have data or stats on, you know, so in the 30s when it was it sugary sodas, like were people just overeating or what, what were some of the oh, stress I mean, or people ate less? It's as simple as that. No, no, I know the 15% that were overweight. What were they doing? It's very different than what we're doing now to be overweight is what I would love to just know. Well, the 15% who were overweight were eating more calories than they were. Just overeating, okay. They were overeating. That's the cause of obesity. I'm sorry. It's as simple as that. Um, Right. um, and, And there's ample evidence that starting in 1980, Americans started eating more. Um, And- you know, eating a lot more, three, four, five hundred calories a day more than they did before. Portion sizes were bigger. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, for no other reason. That's a that's a sufficient reason why people people eat what's in front of them. And since people don't recognize the amount of calories that are in the foods they eat, mm-hmm. it's impossible to count calories, and you shouldn't even try. Um, you want to you want to control the amount of calories that you're eating. You have to weigh yourself every day. If you're gaining weight, you're eating too much, eat less, um, and mm-hmm. so forth. But the um, but stuff- now we're, our food is so much more calorically dense than it was back then. So well, there's more junk food. Yep, yeah, way more. Right. And and it's you know, I mean there, there's just a lot more of it around, and it's also promoted more, and it's and it's been normalized. Mm-hmm. But there's ample evidence that starting that between 1980 and 2000, um, the average number of calories that the average number of calories in the food supply increased by about a thousand. Also, the other factors that I've heard of, because this seems to be unsettled, but maybe is this unsettled science because the food companies and everything want to confuse us like they do with food? Because I've heard that we also became more sedentary, that we were eating out more high fructose corn syrup, more chemicals in the environment. Are any of these also, or is it well, they may be contributing factor, but calories really are, I, I mean, there's, mm-hmm. you know, this is thermodynamics. It's really simple. Um, right. It's calories. And the evidence on eating more calories is very, very clear. Uh, the reasons why people ate, started eating more calories are more complicated. Mm-hmm. I think the major one was portion size. Um, it's the simplest explanation. Portion sizes got bigger. People started eating more calories. But there were other reasons as well. Um, the food industry put in an enormous effort to try to normalize snacking. Um, so the and and also sponsored studies that showed that um, people could control their weight better if they ate more times a day. Actually, the opposite is true. The more times a day you eat, the more calories you take in because people can't judge the number of calories that they're taking in. Um, So if you want to reduce your number of calories, you eat less and you eat less frequently. I mean, it's really pretty simple. Um, And the uh, 
and there were, I mean, there were political things that happened that enabled that. One was there were restrictions on marketing to children that were removed. There were restrictions on health claims on mm. food crop packages that were removed. Um, and food companies quickly learned that the junk food products that what we're now calling ultra processed um, encourage people to eat more. The potato chip ad, you can't eat just one. That's the whole point. These are the most profitable products in the supermarket. Uh, so food companies were doing everything they could to make irresistibly delicious products that people couldn't stop eating. People couldn't stop eating them. They took in more calories. I mean, this is mm -hmm. cause and effect is really pretty easy to see here. And what that means is that if you as an individual are trying not to gain weight, you are fighting an entire food system on your own without help. You're fighting, you want your kids not to eat junk food, you are fighting an entire food system. $1.5 trillion a year, of which billions are spent on trying to get people to eat more. That's fascinating. So, I did not know that the um, that whole snacking, uh, you know, eat small meals throughout the day, it'll keep your blood sugar, Mm -hmm. steady uh, and that's to sell more food the, oh, other, the, the other thing that happened you know that that's sort of amazing yeah it was food suddenly appeared everywhere i can remember mm. when i first came to nyu i came to nyu in 1988 and i used to laugh every time i walked into the library because there were these very entertaining signs all over the library um, of books with cockroaches crawling all over them saying, do not bring food into the library. Um, you know, if you do, you'll be expelled. This is going to ruin the library. It's going to ruin the books. It's going to do all these terrible things. Some of them were quite amusing. I wish I had copies of them. <laughs> they were really pretty funny. Um, well, now there's two cafes in the library and they're vending machines everywhere and nobody even looks to see if anybody's bringing food in. Same thing with bookstores. I can remember when you were not allowed to bring a cup of coffee into a bookstore. Uh, mm -hmm. You might spill coffee on the books. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, and now every bookstore has a cafe in it. Right. Um, and the um, clothing stores. When mm -hmm. did you know when when did cafes come into clothing clothing stores? I I mean it was it really, so the more food you see, the more you buy. The more times you see a food, the more you buy it. And food companies do an extraordinary amount of research to do this. And remember, that's their purpose. Their purpose is to sell more food. Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsie and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group and tell us what you want. The politics of this, which we want to spend plenty of time on, um, but all the demographics of Americans are, are heavier now. Um, but now we're seeing a link between um, poverty and being overweight, which is obviously a direct contradiction to you know, 150, 200 years ago where rich people were fat and the poor people were not. What is going on here? I, I assume there's a lot of food politics at play. Yeah, junk food is cheap. Um, that's the simple answer. Um, and also- Why? Why don't they make it expensive? Like what, is it because more people will have access so then they'll sell more total well, Food? Government policy um, promotes big agriculture, corn, soybeans. That's where all the money goes. 
And corn and soybeans are the basic ingredients for um, for ultra-processed junk foods. And I want to talk about ultra-processed because it's a very important concept. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, you know, <laughs> fruits and vegetables are considered to be specialty crops. Um, and they get very, very little money. I mean, the, the Biden administration has just announced a $50 million um, program to support exports of fruits and vegetables, specialty crops. $50 million is a rounding error in the federal budget. It's absolutely nothing. Right. There's very, very little federal money that goes into promoting consumption of fruits and vegetables. So the Commerce Department, which tracks these things, says that it looks at the change in price of food from 1980 to the present. And the price of food, all foods across the board, has increased since 1980 as part of inflation. But they also break out which foods have increased the most mm -hmm. and which foods have increased in price the least. And the ones that have increased the least are the ultra-processed junk foods. The ones that have increased the most are the specialty crops, fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. So if poor people think that it's expensive to buy broccoli or any of these other kinds of things, um, it's because it is. Mm -hmm. You know, all of the money goes into supporting ultra-processed junk foods. And 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 I need to explain what I mean by ultra-processed. The This is a new concept in nutrition. Only since in 2009, the term was coined, and it refers to a specific category of processed foods. I mean, most foods are processed, and it's not the processing itself that's the problem. It's the industrial processing that converts whatever the foods are into very easily digestible ingredients in, done through industrial processing makes the foods really easy to eat. They're very highly caloric. They're extremely profitable for the companies that make them because the ingredients can be bought when the prices are very low. They have long shelf life. The easiest example is corn. Corn on the cob is unprocessed canned corn or frozen corn is processed. Dorito chips are ultra processed. Mm -hmm. um, so there's now phenomenal amounts of evidence. I mean, just overwhelming evidence that links ultra processed foods to poor health outcome. Um, and those are uh, observational studies that don't prove causation. The observation is that people who eat a lot of ultra processed foods are um, heavier and have more type 2 diabetes, heart disease, etc. Um, but there's one controlled clinical trial that shows that people fed a diet of ultra processed foods as compared to a matched diet of processed food eat 500 calories more a day on average than um, when they were just eating processed foods. So there's something about ultra processed foods that encourages people to eat more. And these diets were matched in protein, fat, carbohydrate, vitamin, minerals, and they were matched in palatability. The people who were, um, and, and this by the way, was a controlled clinical trial in a locked metabolic ward. So the, the subject of this study could not cheat. They had to eat what they were given. They could eat as much as they wanted of it. And the difference between the two diets was the degree of processing, ultra-processed versus processed. And when they were eating the ultra-processed diets, they reported an, or they were found, observed, to consume an average of 500 calories a day more than when they were on the other diet. And they gained a pound a week. Big surprise. Now, 500 calories is enormous. Usually in dietary studies, everybody's happy if they can find a difference of 50 calories. And the other mm -hmm. thing about this study that was so important, and it was done at NIH, the other that was so important was the hypothesis was that there would be no difference. Mm -hmm. The investigators were floored by the result. They didn't expect it, and they certainly didn't expect a result that was that large you know, unambiguously enormous result. Um, 
So what that tells you is if you're interested in maintaining a weight or losing weight, you got to stop eating ultra processed foods or consume ultra processed foods in very carefully restricted amounts. Um, I would never say never because I have my own favorite ultra processed foods. I like eating them, um, but I try not to eat very much of them. Yeah. And they're very addictive. So it just makes it harder. Well, that's what the addictive means. The addictive, I don't know whether it's real addiction, but it certainly is what they call irresistibly delicious. You just, you know, you just can't stop eating. Right. Salads, everybody can stop eating a salad. Oreo cookies, pretty hard to stop. Right. It's the sugar, fat, and salt, or or one of the three that is just uh, right. So let's... Let's talk a little bit about the food politics and the overall tactics that you see the industry use. Well, they, what, are, what are they using? They, the food industry does exactly what the cigarette industry used to do. You know, it took 50 years from the first studies linking cigarette smoking to lung cancer to have a society wide resistance to cigarettes. Mm-hmm. And over 700 studies. Um, that were put, I mean, that's what just really blows me away. I think a lot more than Over, yes. There were thousands and thousands of studies by by the time. uh, I think what finally did it was secondhand smoke. When non-smokers rose up in protest and said, we don't want to be in the room with smokers. Right. When it was clear that secondhand smoke wasn't very good. Um, So it took a very long time. And the reason that it took a long time was that the cigarette industry, as its first effort, cast it down on the science. Um, And that's really all you have to do. All you have to do is say, well, the science wasn't done well. There was this problem. There was that problem. That's all you need to do. And then everybody questions it. Um, And then the cigarette industry funded its own science. It funded its own science. It got, you know, it had spokespeople mm-hmm. who would testify for it. Mm-hmm. Like then, doctors. Yeah, and then it <laughs> did really all the stuff behind the scenes that people don't see, which is, um, you know, lobbying Congress and mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. talking about the loss of jobs. If, you know, if our cigarette, uh, if our cigarette company gets shut down, um, North Carolina won't will lose all these jobs and that kind of thing right. that Congress is very susceptible to. And cigarette companies bought food companies and taught them how to do it. The food company does this. The food companies do the same thing. They cast doubt on uh, any science that links their products to poor health. They fund their own research, something that just drives me crazy. Uh, and I have a, a blog, foodpolitics.com, where every Monday I post an industry-funded study of the week. Um, um, and then I hear from the authors. I try not to make it personal, and I don't post the authors' names, because I, it, I don't think it's personal. I think mm-hmm. it's you know, it's systematic. Um, and I'm dealing with an author this week about it who's very upset. But he, I'm sure he's going to tell me, but my science has done really well. And I'm sure his science is done very well. But um, never mind. Anyway. Well, but wait, yeah, but it's not done well if it's getting these. Oh, it, this is really complicated. The, <gasps> what the data on industry funding shows is that the studies are designed in ways to give the answer. Right, right. You're looking for it. So it isn't the actual co- conduct of the study that's an issue. It's the design of the right. study or its interpretation. So the study will come out and show no difference, and the study mm-hmm. will be interpreted mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as showing that the product did no harm. Yeah. Let me ask you this, because I see this all the time in, in the work that we do, um, uh, fighting for alternatives to dairy and the school system and whatnot. Um, and as a, a former Olympic athlete, I certainly had uh, the dairy industry marketing to me for many years. Oh, and mm-hmm. they are as you know, uh, it's their, their new thing, if you want to say that over the last couple of years at the, you know, the big marathons around the world, um, they are honing in on this study that they did that says milk is more hydrating water. But just to your point, when you go into the study, you <laughs> see that it did not rehydrate the muscles. 
it just gave the pers- people more subcutaneous fluid. So basically they were bloated, um, which no athlete on planet earth is looking to be bloated. They're looking for their muscles to rehydrate so they can go back out and perform. Mm. And I think that's a perfect example, I think, of what exactly what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the specific study, but in general, right. in general, you interpret whatever the results are, even if they don't show anything, you interpret them as positive. And the research on industry funding, um, and there has been years, decades of it, mostly the drug industry has been the one mm-hmm. that's been the most studied because it's so easy to demonstrate that um a particular drug industry that puts a logo for a particular drug, all it takes is a prescription pad and a pen, and a doctor will prescribe that drug more than previously without realizing it. So so this research shows, first of all, the influence is unconscious. People don't recognize it. They didn't intend to be influenced. They're not selling out. Um, they don't even realize that the funding has any influence. Um, but the observation is that industry-funded studies almost invariably come out in favor of the sponsor's interest to the point where I can look at the title of a study and guess who paid for it. You know, I One of the arguments is that, uh, that no one's going to be interested in the question unless someone with a vested interest studies it, and that's the only way we're going to get studies. Um, and of course, if, if right. it doesn't come out with what they want, they don't even publish the study, I imagine, right? Right. They don't have to. Yeah. But I mean, the only reason for doing this study is for marketing purposes that has no real scientific benefit. Yeah. If you, you know, I mean, for example, the the thing that I'm dealing with this professor about this week is um, a study that was on a, a, what caught my eye was the press release for the study, which said that um, this was a study that was designed to prove the benefit of a particular supplement. And I thought, wait a minute, you designed the study to prove the benefit? How about- (laughs) And you're admitting it? (laughs) You know, how about designing this study to compare the benefit of this product to the benefits of other products and see how it comes out? That's two different study designs. Yeah. That study will not be designed the same way. And I get letters all the time from food trade associations saying we're looking for research to demonstrate the benefits of our product. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not going to fund anything. That's that doesn't show benefit. Right. I mean, that's so mm-hmm. it's very easy to design studies to give you the answer that you want. To design yeah. an open ended study that is going to actually determine the truth in that situation, you have to design it in a different way. Um, mm-hmm. And as I said, once it's designed, nobody is arguing about how they conducted it. But then the other part is. Hmm. They're required, most most journals require the authors to reveal who paid for the study and whether the authors had any financial connections with the funder or with the industry that's doing the funding. And almost all of these declarations say uh, the funder had no influence on the design, conduct, or interpretation of the study. That's an outright lie. Yeah. Yeah. Because just the funding itself is an influence. Right. And if I've looked deeper at different times on that and and correct, I mean, I know what you're saying in that study itself, but oftentimes you'll find Fred was paid, you know, 10 years ago by that industry for something that's something different. Yeah, actually, or, you know, it's like, it was more recently than 10 years ago. But you, uh, right, but even so, you know what I mean? They're maybe going to pay him again in another couple of years or you, you see yeah. the connection. You almost always see the connection if you put the two names together. Yeah, if people are disclosing it, which not everybody mm-hmm. does, but mm-hmm. most people do. Um, mm-hmm. But a lot of people think that it doesn't make any difference. I do. Yeah. What are some of the most persistent myths that you when it comes to nutrition that you would like to clear up? Um things that maybe people are confused about. I think the big one is that what you eat is more important than how much you eat for obesity. Um, You talked earlier about about 
the fact that a calorie is a calorie. Yeah, I mean, some foods are healthier. Some sources of calories are healthier than others. But by and large, to a first approximation, if you want to lose weight, you have to eat less and move more. It works every time. Mm -hmm. oh, 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 so you're saying, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. You're saying how much you eat is more important than what you eat. For obesity, absolutely. Got it. Absolutely. It may be that some people find a low carbohydrate diet easier to follow than a low fat diet. Um, but, you know, those studies that have compared low fat to low carbohydrate diets don't find any difference. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the overall caloric deficit that makes a difference in losing weight. So I think that's the biggest one because the low carb and low fat people are so extremely fat. Um, I'm passionate about their particular point of view. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I just think it's really, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've just been asked to give a talk on low carb versus low fat diets. Mm. Why do they want to know about that? I want to talk about calories. So the, or at least uh, remind people that calories matter. Sometimes it makes a difference that some foods are certainly healthier than others. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think people want to you know to do the calorie thing anymore. And you know what I mean? It's just like it's the it's the old school, it's the truth. It's right. calories in, calories out. People are like, no, don't let that be the right. thing. Tell me what right. food to eat. And the like yeah. so there's some magic potion. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, there's no yeah. magic you know, I mean, I think that a healthy diets are as I said, I'm a lumper, right? <laughs> I'm a lumper. Um, the, you know, and the journalist Michael Pollan does it in seven words. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Mm -hmm. Really, that takes care of it. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it takes care of absolutely all of it as long as you define food as food that foods that are not ultra processed. Right. Eat whole food. Yeah. Yes. Yes. As long as you're eating minimally or or lightly or just processed foods, um, yeah. and not the ultra processed ones, um, and you're not eating too much, and you got a lot of plant foods in your diet, you're doing fine. You don't have to worry about anything else, mm -hmm. and you can eat deliciously. What are your thoughts on the messaging that you can be overweight and healthy at the same time? Is that true? It could be. It could be. It depends on how overweight. And the more overweight people are, the higher the... We're talking here about risk, which is a probability mm. estimate. Very hard for people to understand probability. Um, being overweight is not a death sentence. Being somewhat overweight may actually help you live longer, although I would not want to get into the arguments about the cut points there. Um, but mm. there's no question that a higher body weight or, a, you know, particularly if it's fat, um, a, the higher proportion of body fat, maybe let's put it that way, a higher proportion of body fat raises your risk for type 2 diabetes for sure. For heart disease, for certain kinds of cancers, bad outcome for COVID-19, and overall mortality. I mean, that's been shown over and over and over again. But it's a probability. And when you apply population-based probabilities to individuals, you're in trouble because individuals vary. Mm. And so... Uh, and uh, um, uh, you know the the body mass index is a population estimate. It's not an individual estimate. When you apply the BMI to individuals, it doesn't have the same kind of meaning that it does when you apply it to populations. But I don't think there's any question that being overweight is a risk factor for chronic disease. How much of a risk factor depends on a lot of personal factors. Right. So could somebody who's overweight be really healthy? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but the probability of their being really healthy is smaller than the probability of somebody who isn't overweight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A difficult concept. We have a new release of the U.S. Dietary Guidelines coming out next year. Mm -hmm. Can you give some examples of how the food industry continues, has influence and continues to influence uh, what what comes out in the new, each new edition of the dietary guidelines? Yeah. First of all, the dietary guidelines really haven't changed since 1980, even though this will be the 10th edition <laughs> or something like that. Um, they, from the very first edition, 
they said, eat less sugar, salt, and saturated fat, eat more fruits and vegetables, mm -hmm. and balance calories from the beginning. Um, and then alcohol is in there, too. Don't drink too mm -hmm. much alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, but phrased in different words and, uh, you know, different, but the meaning is the same. Um, where I think the food industry influence comes in is that when the guidelines talk about what to eat more of, they talk about foods, fruits, and veg fr fruits vegetables, grains, foods. When they talk right. about what to eat less of, they switch to nutrients, <laughs> um, the sugar, salt, saturated fat. Uh. So, uh -huh. because if they were to talk about the major sources of those nutrients in American diets, they would have to tell people to eat less meat and dairy foods. They would have right. to let snack foods because that's where the salt is and uh, sugar sweetened beverages because that's where the sugar is. Those are the main sources. Um, and they would step on the toes of the food industry, particularly the meat industry is the most sensitive mm -hmm. and over the years has been the most sensitive to uh, any kind of guideline that suggests eating less meat. Mm -hmm. but that issue has become uh, more prominent in recent years as more evidence has come out about the role of beef in climate change. Um, so that as right. more, more has been learned about the fact that ruminant animals burp methane um, and other greenhouse gases, uh, the, there's been an enormous political effort to keep any question of sustainability out of the dietary guidelines. Um, in the last round, right. there was a huge furor about it, and Congress actually wrote in report language that the Department of Agriculture was not to say one word about sustainability and it didn't. Mm -hmm. And for this round of dietary guidelines, they announced in advance that sustainability would not be part of the dietary guidelines. Um, right. So that's one place where industry comes in. Uh, <clears throat> the guidelines this time are dealing with whether uh, ultra processed foods have anything to do with obesity. And it will be very, very interesting to see how that discussion comes out with the in the scientific report, because one of the things that uh, agencies have instructed the committee is not to pay any attention to the study at NIH that I mentioned, because mm -hmm. it ran for four weeks and they're not considering studies that didn't run for 12 weeks. Well, that study was done in a me metabolic ward, locked. Mm -hmm. um, and those are very expensive studies to run in a 12 week one. First of all, to get somebody lock, locked up in a metabolic ward for three months is asking a lot. Um, but I think they will have to. I, I don't see how they could possibly ignore that study. It's just mm -hmm. too important. Um, so it's, it's hard to say. I mean, every food company that stands to gain or lose from the dietary guidelines is going to file comments uh, in the usual way. And, you know, what the advisory committee will do with those mm -hmm. comments, I have no idea. But the point is that the guidelines process has changed a lot and become far more political because when I was on the dietary guidelines advisory committee in 1995, my committee chose the things we were going to research, did the research, um, wrote the research report and wrote the dietary guidelines. We did the whole thing. Today, the agencies decide on the research questions and the agencies write the guidelines. Um, and the 2025 dietary guidelines will be produced after the next election. Mm -hmm. So um, they're going to get caught up in the political process. It'll depend on who's president and who's the head of those agencies. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You, Dotsie mentioned earlier that you've uh, you've written actually two books about pet food, and uh, Americans and people all over the world love their cats and dogs. I actually, when I, I have cats, and I have a hard time reading the labels for my cats. Mm -hmm. So I just go with the ones that seem the healthiest and say no grains. That's sort of my only template and maybe are a little more expensive because right? I figure 
don't know, maybe it's higher quality ingredients. So what, you what should... are the pet food industry's core customer? <laughs> yes. Tell me what I need to know to be a better pet parent, please. Yes. <laughs> well, first of all, there's a reason why you can't read the label because it's a feed label, not a food label. So that's the first thing. And there's been a lot of discussion in the pet food industry about switching over to a pet food facts label that people might actually be able to read. Um, pet food. When you say feed feed label, does that mean it's agricultural? Yeah, and... the kind of feed that you feed farm animals. Ah, okay. it's, covered, it, it's covered by those regulations instead of food regulations and um, the American Association of Feed Control Officials governs what's on the, what's in pet food and what's on the label, um, with a lot of interest in trying to make it more consumer friendly. But the pet food companies would just as soon it wasn't, um, for obvious reasons. You know, dogs used to eat whatever they could get their jaws on and cats you see mice or whatever they could catch uh, small mm -hmm. birds unfortunately but also mice so once um the scientists figured out what the nutritional needs of pet food of pets were they could put everything together in one can um and simplify the whole question of what pets eat. I mean, pets have specific food requirements and um, actually they're not very complicated. And in the book that I wrote with Melda Nesheim, um, What Pets Eat, we have a recipe for homemade pet food in there that works pretty well. Okay, um, It's not all that hard to do, but commercial pet food makes your life much simpler and the dry stuff is really cheap. Um, and the marketing of pet food, well, all yeah. pet foods without exception, are made from the byproducts of human food production. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and they're very useful. Uh. Purposes. And that's why, and it's so interesting because, like you said, cats actually eat mice, voles, they don't eat fish. They don't go into a river and catch a fish. They don't eat beef. They don't, <laughs> they don't catch a cow. So yeah. it's really, that that actually explains why we aren't feeding, my, uh, at least cats, yeah. their, their natural diet. Well, you can buy frozen mice to feed to cats. You, you can. You really can. But not in a can. <laughs> you, you, I mean, maybe canned mice. That I haven't seen. You certainly can buy them frozen. Um, and so... You know, once you get over the idea that cats are eating the byproducts of human food production, but nutritionally, it's okay, the rest of it is marketing. And and part of it is that there's very, very little research done on pet food in the way that, to answer the kinds of questions that you and I might have. I would like to know, for example, whether the cheapest um, canned pet food as compared to the most expensive uh, canned pet food makes any difference to a pet's health. Nobody is going to do that study. For one thing, it would be very expensive. You'd have to keep animals for a long time mm -hmm. um, in cages and feed them to different diets. That's not the kind of research that pet food companies do. Pet food companies do one kind of research, and that is which product does the animal like better? That's the mm -hmm. only thing they care about is what can we put in the product that will make the dog just to head straight for mm -hmm. that can instead of somebody else's and similarly for cats. Uh, so, you know, I don't know how to answer people's questions about that. I know people who swear that their pets are healthier if they cook for their pets themselves. And I know plenty of people who cook for their pets themselves. Um, and I know people who feed their pets the cheapest possible pet food they can do, and they claim their pets do just fine. I don't know. I mean, if if they're making the pet food so that the animals will eat it, then wouldn't it also, I mean, I know that just like the food companies make junk food full of salt, sugar, and fat so that we'll eat it, aren't they putting junk, a lot of junk in that canned food? Yeah. And what is the most serious health product among pets? Obesity. Mm just like in people. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that has to do, particularly with dogs, a lot of it has to do with dog treats. <laughs> dog, you know, because 
Um, Max. <laughs> part of it, if your relationship with your pet is based on your feeding that pet, and that's the way in which you interact with the pet, pet then you're going to give it treats all the time. And treats have calories. The more time you feed pet, the more calories it takes in. It's the same thing. You are 87 years young and you have so much vitality. And in fact, right before our interview with you, you went on a, a long walk in very cold New York City. Can you tell us a little bit about your health routine that keeps you so vital and how you incorporate the science that you know into your own life? Well, I, I attribute it to good nutrition, <laughs> the, uh, but I laugh when I say it. I don't know. I think it's a lot of it is luck. I'm, you know, I, I get, and it was some terrific stroke of genetics because my father died at the age of 47 uh, of a heart attack. Uh, so he was not, you know, he had, oh. you know, we would, this was a long time ago. And, uh, you know, we would say he had That's multiple true. risk factors for coronary artery disease. He was an obese three pack a day smoker. I never smoked. So that's one thing that, you know, I had going for me is I never smoked cigarettes. Um, and that's the number one issue of mm -hmm. all of the behavioral issues um, for longevity. Cigarette smoking is the number one thing. And I, my father gave mm -hmm. me a cigarette when I was five years old and told me to inhale. I never did it again. I don't recommend, wow. I don't recommend that as a, as a method, but it sure took care of me. I never did it again. <laughs> Um, and the, um, so, so I don't know. I mean, part of it was not smoking. Part of it was liking vegetables. Yeah. I just have always liked them. And that dates back to a summer camp I went to, uh, when I was quite young, um, they had a garden at the camp and I loved the vegetables in the garden. I thought they were absolutely delicious. Um, so that, so there was <laughs> that and I follow my own advice which I don't find it very hard to follow, which is um, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Yeah. I, mean, I just find that very easy to do. Um, and I live in New York City and don't have a car. If I want to mm -hmm. do anything, I'm on my feet. Yeah. So what did you eat for breakfast and lunch today? Uh, let's see. Today I went to Sullivan Street Bakery on a field trip and had their bobolini and coffee. <laughs> What's a bobolini? It's like a donut. It's donut. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not today, Marianne. We should have. <laughs> but she didn't need a lot of them. And she didn't snack one. in between. I had one. I had there one. you go. An okay. Donut. As I said, I have my favorite junk foods and my favorite right. ultra, ultra. Although this wasn't ultra processed. It was made with home ingredients and made in a very nice bakery. Um, ordinarily I'll have a, for breakfast, when I eat breakfast, which is quite late, uh, I'll have a, um, you know, some kind of cereal and fruit. Okay. I like it. Yeah. And lunch? Did you have a big kale bowl or something? Well, unfortunately I'm still waiting for lunch. So, oh, I, no. okay. so as soon as we get off of this, I'm going to go have lunch. Oh, well, we'll let you go so you can eat your delicious lunch um, <laughs> full of non-processed foods. Thank you so much for being on the show. We really learned a lot and so appreciate your work all these years, really opening people's eyes to the food system that we are, uh, well, that is trying to brainwash us. <laughs> well, thanks very much. This was fun. <laughs>